Okay, all right. Um, hello, everyone. Hope you can hear me clearly. Uh, welcome to the second webinar in our Marx Lawn program. Uh, this evening, uh, we are delighted to have with us uh, Rohit Goel, who's joining from Mumbai, um, uh, Rizio, who's also joining from Mumbai, and Padmini Chetur, who's joining from Chennai. Uh, Rizio, Padmini, and Rohit, if you can all say hi to the audience. Hope they can see and hear you. Hello. Hi. Hello. Yep. Sorry. This is this is the trick. Hi, <laughs> I'm your turn. Hi, I'm Padmini. <laughs> Okay, great. And I'm Rinalini Vasudevan, uh, assistant editor at Mark, joining you from Calcutta. Uh, I'm very pleased to introduce today's session, which is on the art of incompletion. Uh, this evening's conversation is part of a longer series of talks that we are organizing uh, based on the broader topic of uh, futures of the planet and art worlds to come. Uh, last Wednesday, we had a really engaging discussion with uh, photographer and activist Ravi Agarwal and scholar Heather Davis. Um, uh, they were discussing matters related to art, uh, environmentalism, and the Anthropocene. Uh, and they threw light on these discourses in the current context of the pandemic, as well as the growing protests against race, caste, and gender discrimination in India, America, and other parts of the world. Um, continuing in that vein and um, focusing on the present moment of the crisis, uh, we turn today um, to look a little inwards um, to consider matters related to human bodies, uh, speech, language, and performance. Um, and of course, Rohit and Padmini are there to share their insights on the matter with us. Uh, this period of the lockdown has, uh, of course, uh, had its impacts on our surroundings, but also on our physical and mental selves. And it has got us to um, change so many of our basic habits and patterns and expectations and interactions. Uh, and uh, the change has been, of course, not just at the level of everyday rituals and performance practices, uh, but it has also had its effects uh, in the larger realm of performance within the field of arts and aesthetics and careers and professions. Uh, so a lot of uh, professional performers, um, actors, uh, dancers, musicians, acrobats, uh, no longer have easy access to the spaces and the audiences uh, which have sustained their practice and work for so long. Uh, and they are having to rethink the ways in which they rehearse, the ways in which they conceptualize and present pieces, reach out to others, as well as look at newer sources of support and funding and patronage in these strange times. Um, keeping in mind this context, uh, therefore, we are looking at, of course, not just ourselves, but then performance within that space. Uh, and uh, to uh, give us further insight into this matter of negotiation and looking at older and present uh, kinds of incompletion, um, we will have uh, a conversation between Rohit as well as Padmini. Uh, Rohit's background is in social and political science, and he has uh, degrees from Harvard, um, uh, the University of Chicago, as well as Cambridge. Uh, he is currently um, professor and director at the Bombay Institute of Cultural Analysis and Research. And he has taught uh, courses in critical theory, uh, historiography, and politics at Gyan Pravaha, Mumbai, um, and uh, elsewhere in Europe and and um, uh, abroad, uh, such as uh, the University of Chicago, Ciosco Paris, and uh, the American Institute, uh, the American University of Beirut. Uh, Padmini uh, is a well-known contemporary dancer, and uh, her training has been under uh, Chandralekha. Since 2001, she's uh, developed a choreographical practice of her own, um, which uh, is abstract, um, minimalist, and very formal, and uh, returns to uh, questions of anatomy and uh, basic bodily language and processes. Um, uh, her interest is in uh, the dancing body and its context to its immediate surroundings, but also looking at the subject within a longer socio-cultural history and context. 
cost. Uh, and this is reflected in many of her well-known works, uh, which include uh, Beautiful Thing, Wall Dancing, Barnum, Fragility, Paper Dolls. She's taken these works to um, various places in India and abroad. And uh, she's also moved beyond traditional platforms uh, to uh, look at visual art spaces, such as the Kochi Biennale, and present her work in the form of film and durational performance. Padmini has also contributed to our 2017 Contemporary Dance magazine. Uh, and of course, we are very pleased to have both Rohit and Padmini with us. And uh, the conversation is going to be contextualized by Rizio Yohanan, who is the CEO of the Mark Foundation. So uh, before we get into the thick of things, uh, just a few uh, guidelines to ensure that the webinar experience is smooth for everybody. Uh, one is that, of course, uh, the audio should ideally be muted uh, so that you can hear all speakers clearly. Uh, if any of you are facing problems with uh, bandwidth and connectivity and video, uh, then mute the video and just listen. Uh, I think that's going to be easier. Uh, you won't be able to see all speakers at the same time. So you're going to be seeing whoever is speaking at that particular moment. Um, then uh, on uh, the side of your screen, there's going to be a bar with a few options. Uh, uh, you can look at the Q&A tab to pose questions to the speakers. Uh, when you're posing a question, you will be able to see only your question, not the ones uh, being written by others. But I'll be able to see uh, everybody's questions. Um, and um, at the end of the first hour, I'm going to be making a selection from there. And I'm going to be presenting uh, those questions to Padmini and um, Rohit and Rizio. It would be great if you uh, could also specify in a question if it's addressed to uh, one of the speakers. Uh, at the end of the first hour, we'll also be running a poll with uh, two more questions, which is for the general audience and for everybody to respond. Um, yes, I think that's uh, good enough for now. I'll see you guys at the end of the first hour, and I'm passing the panel on to Rizio. Thank you, Mrinalni, and uh, welcome all of you, though I can't see everybody. Uh, I'm assuming that uh, everyone is there and, uh, you know, safe and well at this time. Um, thank you, Rohit and Patmini, for joining us. Uh, uh, the, I'm, I'm, I'm sure this is going to be a very insightful session. We are starting this conversation uh, where, we, uh, where we left uh, 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 last, uh, uh, last week. Um, the takeaway from that conversation between Ravi Agawal and Heather Davis uh, as Mrinalini said, was we were talking about uh, beyond the Anthropocene. So uh, the, the final takeaway was that we should have a new language. We should move towards a new language, a new mode of understanding and articulation um, in order to appreciate the possibilities of uh, uh, a post-Anthropocene universe. Uh, and to envision and actualize uh, their interconnections also, these uh, interconnections of these possibilities. So uh, we also uh, kind of discussed and concluded that listening uh, is a very responsible mode, mode of communication in the post-human world. Um, today we are taking from taking off from there and uh, Patnini and uh, Rohit will be looking at language. Uh, 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 language as idea and practice of thought, expression, performance, reception, response. Uh, and at this time, when, as Mrinali said, we are looking at uh, uh, this pandemic situation uh, and thinking of uh, ways to, uh, ways to uh, negotiate this, rethinking, etc. But our struggle at this time has also taught us one thing, uh, largely that uh, we, the human is a striving being and not a perfectible uh, being, you know, if we can use the term. So that realization uh, is perhaps uh, uh, the most important realization uh, of, of this time. Uh, this, this has been a realization with perhaps artists and philosophers and thinkers, but I think this realization has percolated to all levels of, uh, um, uh, you know, all demographies at this time. So that, that 
could uh, that's a, that's an important moment for us the question at the moment is can we turn this moment of realization into a moment of a creative moment a moment of art uh, say as rohit and patnani would say an art of incompletion because that is perhaps the best that we can do at this point so in this context perhaps if we are thinking about that possibility it is also important to see what is the current uh, perception uh, the public perception of art and artists so i would like to refer to a, a recent survey which was done by uh, by the sunday edition of the straits times uh, in singapore um, uh, they asked 1000 respondents uh, uh, what to list five a uh, top 5 essential and non essential jobs and uh, uh, when when uh, this was asked the results were like the out of the first five uh, uh, non essential jobs the topmost was artist so this uh, naturally resulted in a lot of outcry from the artist communities uh, across the world now even now this that that those discussions are happening and the consumer research firm which did the survey they had to come out with a clarification and they said like we actually gave a definition of uh, the essential uh, so, uh, essential worker and um, uh, the, so that their definition and they gave the definition also they uh, they have now uh, publicized the definition so the the that this is the survey which chetan is showing you so these are the results of this of that survey so the 71% people said uh, uh, this artist is a top uh, topmost non essential job so the uh, the the a definition which they gave to these respondents was that uh, an essential worker is one who does uh, who is engaged in a work that meets the basic needs and the basic needs are food health safety and cleaning so from here i go to uh, i i want to refer back to uh, our conversation last week about where we talked about the ongoing ecological collapse and the imminent mental collapse you know in this in this infotech biotech world because we cannot we are not able to yet grasp the complexity of our own mental space and we are uh, uh, exposing ourselves to the 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 new innovation the new new inventions in in the infotech and biotech world Uh, uh and how this might lead to a lead to a mental collapse so if there this danger is very real and in front of us this this mental collapse then uh, uh is mental health an important part of the larger human health and then can we say that during this lockdown art has not played an important role uh in in maintaining our when mental well being that it is uh, it has somehow kept us uh, within the space of our uh, mental health so uh, if uh, during this lockdown especially because we are we are uh, now listening to a lot of news about uh, suicides happening during this lockdown so so this is a very real thing uh, in in this kind of a situation so then why is this survey which has included health as an important as an essential uh, or basic need not including mental health in in the larger health so that is one question so why is uh, the artist who might be able to provide some kind of a solution there not an essential essential uh, worker so these are questions which are emerging from this kind of survey i'm just giving you this example show how we use language in a very exclusive manner and we are so used to in especially institutions and establishments are used to using language in this kind of a categorical uh, exclusive uh, kind of manner ignoring things in, on the peripheries things in between etc so this and in if we are now trying to adjust to the new normal this is what uh, this is the phrase which is going uh uh going around uh now uh, my video it seems uh, has been muted uh, 
maybe because of the bandwidth, I think. But anyway, you can hear me, I guess. Uh, so uh, if we are to if we uh, have to continue to uh, create a, a new uh, language uh, and to rethink this situation that we are in, if we are using the same language that that I just uh, complexity of this language and the the, the, the problems associated with this language. If it's the same language that we are using to, uh, to, to renew ourselves, to rethink um, our, our ways, then uh, we'll, where will it lead us? Uh, we, uh, won't we create new categories of essential, non-essential, uh, useless, useful, etc.? And it may not, uh, if, if this is the same language that you see, we are using, it will not perhaps lead to uh, the play of language that uh, Ravi and Heather were talking about. It will further make the poor, the disabled, the artist, all these, uh, categorize all these people into useless and non-essential. So this, uh, uh, this situation is what where we are. In now, so I also want to uh, at this point I want to uh, read one sentence from Foucault's book uh, *Madness and Civilization*. Uh, it's it's a larger contemplation on uh, on confinement. He says when a board of trade published its report on the poor, in which it proposed the means to render them useful to the public, render the poor useful to the public, it was made quite clear that the origin of poverty was neither scarcity nor unemployment, but the weakening of discipline and the relaxation of morals. That means if you are stricter with the uh, poor, they will become more useful, something to that effect. You know? So when, when even policies and such papers are, you are indicating that uh, indicating this categorical uh, kind uh, or validating this kind of categor categorization, then how do we move to a new a new way of thinking? Uh, because we are using the same same language, so it is as though we are all whole numbers, and between two whole numbers, we don't have uh, any anything. Uh, in actuality, between two whole numbers, we have an infinitude of numbers available, but just that we are invisibilizing them by putting these holes on, on either side. So at this point, our question is that we are addressing in this, uh, in this conversation is, how do we uh, uh, not fall into the same supremacist trap that we have been in? Can art help? in creating this new uh, new way uh, uh, to, 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 to move towards a post-human world. As Patmini, um, as um, Rinaldi said, Patmini is uh, trained under uh, Chandralekha, the radical uh, uh, dancer and choreographer. So she, uh, yesterday I was attending a lecture by Patmini and she said that Chandra would always say that when, an, when a dancer enters the stage, she's charged, she has to charge the, uh, the space. That is what the dancer should do. So uh, why we think art is a space which, which provides this hope that it is essential for us is because art does not allow complacency. It, it is it 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 charges the space all the time. Its performance is critical to at all times, and it tells us how to live on the edge, push the boundaries, and it stays awake and vigilant even when there is no coronavirus or uh, such risks there. It always by inherently it is critical. So it is this spirit that we that might help us to move towards a new new world and uh, if we have to fill our language with that spirit then we have to necessarily understand what our the nature and nature of our language human language as different from other 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 animals other beings so this is this is the place where I would like to invite uh, Patmini and uh, Rohit into this conversation and uh, I'm sure they will enlighten you uh, about this context of the language, the human language and uh, 
I'm sure this evening will be very insightful. Uh, over to you, Rohit and Patmini. Great. Thank you. Uh, I hope I'm audible. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Mrinalini, for that introduction and Rizio for that uh, you know, very thought-provoking uh, contextualization. And to Marg and to both of you for inviting what's quite a speculative conversation that's been emerging uh, between myself and Padmini, although I think it's been more recently emerging as a result of the, the pandemic and our work together um, on, on, on courses. Um, it's been ongoing, I think, in telepathic ways for many, many years. So we're really grateful for the opportunity to speculate together on the body and language. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to start by asking, I guess, a cluster of questions. So Padmini, you'll have to be patient with me until I get through the cluster and then um, take as many or as few as, as, as you can. Um, and, then, and then we'll move to you. So I guess I want to start by asking you, um, and we've been talking a bit about this, but in this time of pandemic, um, of lockdown, of social distancing, these are sort of the terminologies that have come up in this time. Um, obviously, the question of bodies, uh, you know, the sensation of touch, um, they've come under analysis, under critical analysis. They've come front and center, um, uh, today especially. Um, there's also been a lot of speculation on human bodies um, are going to be able to relate to one another, not only during this time of pandemic, but also in its aftermath, when we haven't been able to, 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 to necessarily, or we've been asked or trained not to touch or to, to interact. Um, which has been quite a break and nice break in some ways uh, for me. Um, so there's also been a lot of speculation on how human bodies relate with this event or in this time of pandemic, how they will after this time of pandemic, um, in this time that Rizio um, alerted us to will be called the new normal, which is the, the terminology that's being used. And here the speculation about the body, right? Um, and it's perhaps transformed, um, relation to other bodies. Um, it's not just about um, sociality. Uh, it's, not, it's, it's not about uh, you know, being in physical classrooms, uh, spaces, uh, lectures, um, but it's really taken center stage, it seems, no pun intended, with regards to um, ruminations on performance, right? From curators, from gallerists, from museums, from academics, um, from performers themselves. Um, who are interested in what they call performance studies. So with this potential end of uh, the live performance, the culmination of uh, an artistic process with regards to the body, with the potential end of something like a live performance, um, and in live performances, of course, a body dances or moves on stage um, in front of bodies that are, that are gathered to watch um, uh, or hopefully watch. Um, in, this, in this time of a crisis, maybe, for the performing arts, um, but we need to rethink the performing arts entirely. Maybe that's something of a, of a question. Um, so now we'll get to the end of the cluster. Is there something about this pandemic for you that is compelling you to think or to rethink performance? Uh, to think of performance is, as being in crisis because of this really stupid, idiotic, external viral attack of COVID that has, that has occurred to humanity. Um, and I ask this because for me, um, for me, your work is always uh, it's always been in critical conversation with performance, even in so-called times of normalcy, whether there's a pandemic or not. So crisis or normalcy. Um, so almost as though I've seen a lot of your work as maybe not seeing performance as always already in crisis, irrespective of a pandemic um, or a war or, 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 or an economic recession. I've always seen your work, at least in critical conversation and in self-reflexive interrogation about the very performances that you're that you're, that you're choreographing and that, 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 that you're dancing yourself. So if, if you can take that general sort of thought and set of questions about performance, crisis, normalcy, pandemic, bodies, um, and, and try and respond. I'm going to mute myself so I don't, so, so I, I won't come on screen. I think you'll be able to come on screen. Thank you, Rohit. Thank you, Nanalini, Rizio, um, for both the introduction, but also Rizio to you for the sort of larger optimism around the, the future possibilities for, for the arts and performance. And out the, at the outset, I just want to say I might accidentally lapse into the usage of the term artist and not stay only to the terminology of the performing artist. But it's also very difficult, I think, in a country like India, because the term artist itself means so many different 
um, things. It means the textile weaver. It also could mean a Bollywood actor. And as we know, the layers of the realities that all of these artists uh, are facing are quite different. So I don't want to propose what I'm about to propose um, as a kind of a self-indulgency that's coming out of, of course, a position of privilege. But I want to just uh, use it specifically to propose ideas and not something more literal than this. So to come to one of the early questions, um, we're in a moment now where everybody is saying, does performance have to be rethought? Because we aren't, because audiences aren't allowed to gather, um, performing art artists aren't allowed to travel, which is a big part of what they actually have to do. Because, especially for the contemporary artist, I think we're so little actually engaging the society that surrounds us. <clears throat> and we're always somehow having to project our work to the global market. So, all this has been restricted now. And so we're coming back again and again to this idea that we're fearful of bodies. We don't. We might get infected through the the sputum of the singer on the stage. All these kinds of inane conversations. But on reflection about this, my question back is: Shouldn't we always be reflecting on performance anyway? And haven't there been? This isn't an isolated moment in history where movement or performing of movement has been disallowed. So I'm going to now just first give us a few very key examples of moments when actually we haven't been allowed to perform. The first example I'm coming to is actually the beginning of the colonial movement, the colonial rule in India, where Bharatanatyam itself was looked upon as too vulgar to continue uh, as a practice. And so there was a kind of a banning of, of the dance form. So in a sense, that was already for 100 years within this country. We were performance in the south of India was not allowed. I mean, I know the reference is very far away, but I just want to bring this into the conversation. Jumping onward to the work that Chandra did, who actually again stopped herself from performing Bhardhanatyam, saying that the content had no meaning, no reference anymore, didn't make sense as a narrative. And when she comes back to performance, she's already saying in the 80s that we need to really rethink this. We need to somehow rescue performance from the whole idea of it remaining spectacle, it uh, being commodified. She talked a lot about the uh, commodification of the body itself. So there was, this is kind of the context within India, which we already have and perhaps have forgotten. And so I'm trying to bring it back into the memory of things. And another very strong moment to bring us into this uh, conversation around language and incompletion is to look at the, the beginning of kind of um, contemporary, but also especially the conceptual dance movements, which came from Europe, where all of a sudden dancers started to feel this whole business of standing up on stage and moving made no sense anymore. That audiences weren't able to follow the sort of the muted uh, discourse that dance was bringing to the stage. And so choreographers were again intentionally stopping the performance of movement um, and, and turning to language. Um, language not just as a kind of a description or a discourse around what they were doing, but as a way to really make us again almost crave the movement. And I remember a beautiful comment of a young Estonian dancer who said, well, we're all still looking uh, for reasons to move. And I remember in my own case being in a project of the French choreographer, Boris Charmatz, who came up with a, what he calls a manifesto for the future of dance. And his project specifically, which was Musée de la Danse, so the Museum of Dance, was really looking at the fact that, well, performance is so ephemeral, you know, and he was inviting people into the project 
and he was just he was preventing dancers from moving and saying but that's too easy can we do this another way can we articulate this another way so there's been all of this history of when dancers have had to stop and i think this is just another one of those situations and perhaps we can look at it um in a positive way as well as a way to to pause and and really question the whole idea of product taking so much prevalence over process to so because all of a sudden we have time has become um a luxurious commodity that's in our hands as well so how are we going to now address or how are we going to bridge these areas i mean as rizio said again when she talked about mental health perhaps in these times out of sheer boredom a lot more people are, are looking towards art as a way to fill time in a sense but to my mind again this kind of easy or lazy shifting between medium you know dance rehearsals shifting into the zoom form dancers suddenly all turning into filmmakers and and in my own case as well i mean when i was talking to a, an artist friend in calcutta he said oh it's so worrisome suddenly in this time of corona artists are becoming thinkers and philosophers you know because there's no other way to uh, um, to fill our, our time and our space so these are just some of the the thoughts that i was thinking about and just to end with three small examples because you were we're talking about how my own practice in its extension beyond already the framework that chandra established of art not just giving in to consumption by the audience but art having the possibility of really pushing the radical boundaries and the space between audience and and dancer i'm thinking first of all to my performance varnam where the opening and the the image that returns time and time again is of six dancers sitting on chairs and the first 5 minutes of the performance actually nothing happens and it's it's a moment where actually the idea of the gaze becomes centralized to the conversation of the varnam itself who's looking at who and the audience is, is immediately put in this very awkward position of having to think about the their own gaze on the dancers and the reflection of that almost like a looping or a, a mirroring multiple mirrors between the performing uh gaze the performer's gaze itself and the audience that was one moment when i think that i was really uh trying to think about this inversion in a sense um and beyond this when i started to work on wall dancing so also in those years it was really important for me to move away from this black box dark room situation where the audience sort of sits back and is consuming the image of dancing bodies so i took dance into a white a bright whitely uh, lit space and i reversed again i made the audience come to the center of the space the dancers is working around the space the audience has to move but the audience also has a choice so in a way i wanted to really let go of the kind of tyrannical um conversation between performance and audience can both the performer the performance and the audience be free from each other and actually choose to be with each other and can that choice have a lot more openness between it so that was another a strategy that i was thinking around with wall dancing which is also 3 hours long so i start also dealing with duration as a way to really counter this kind of market imposition often on performance to be short and sweet to be quick and fast so all of these expectations i needed to challenge and the last example uh, which will bring me to 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 return to our conversation on in incompletion was the newest solo i've been making with a series of writers philosophical enactment where i'm really looking at the question of perhaps dance needs to be explained perhaps there needs to be mediation through language in order for for the movement to have a kind of a, a possibility of translation 
And as I, as I talk about that particular work, which I've shared with you before, I'm coming back to the idea of, of language and body. And I'm also thinking, because we were talking about human animal and the human condition right from the moment of, of birth, you know, and as we all know, all we can actually do at birth is move. We, we cannot speak. And there's been a whole kind of multiple forms of, of trainings, pedagogy for dancers that's actually asking us to remember, remember movement uh, the way we first knew it. But at the same time, as I sit here with you, who's an academic, we're mediating this conversation, this transaction as well through language. Um, and the more we can articulate or we can find the possibility of clarity between us, um, the more I think that things become, we move towards an accessibility of something that's otherwise easily a very inaccessible space, I think. So can we maybe, can I pass it, this conversation back to you? And would you like to say something around um, body language? Sure. Thank you so much. Uh, that was great. Um, and I'm going to try to uh, go back to Varnum, um, your piece Varnum. Uh, so I'm glad you brought that up in the context of trying to accessibly communicate. Um, my current philosophical uh, speculative project is really about human animal difference, as we've talked about. Um, and that's forced me to, you say, dancers are now becoming philosophers. I certainly could not become a, a dancer, but it's forced me to think about um, something I've really never thought about before um, at the age of almost 40 now, which is my body um, and its, its, its increasing fragility. And um, as, as, I, as I grow older, and, I, and uh, it's something I've never really had to reflect on. So this has been a really important pandemic and or time, I should say, this luxury of time has been really important for me as a philosopher um, from the other side, it's, it's been really helpful for me to think about my body and to, to reflect on it. And what's, what, what I've been reflecting on um, sort of at the intersection of two traditions, um, again, I'm going to try not to use any jargon, either um, Marx's, Marxian um, jargon or, or psychoanalytic jargon. So those are the two major disciplines of philosophy that, I, that I've been working with um, and through in thinking about uh, this gap, uh, this incompletion of um, the particularly human animal. Um, and birth, is, birth has been absolutely fundamental to the way in which I've been thinking about this incompletion. Um, uh, thinking about how, uh, so Mark says that animals are born like a, a dog, a gopher, they're born into, uh, they're born into earth, with, into a fixed ecological niche. They don't have, um, there's, there's no distance between themselves and ecology. So there's no gap between their bodies, their beings, and language. Um, humans are born uh, tr traumatically, and this is, uh, this is the trauma of birth, the fundamental or the fancy word, I promise no jargon, but let's just say it wants ontological, right, for the philosophers who might, might be here, if there are any. Um, the ontological trauma of birth, which is a separation from from the mother, the, 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 the separation of two bodies, right? Um, a womb and, 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 and uh, the mother and, and the child. And yes, ch children don't, don't or infants do not speak, but they cry, right? And it's that primal scream or that primal cry that's announcing the distance between the body being um, one with the body um, in the womb, let's say, and now having experienced this trauma of separation. What uh, Marx and psychoanalysis calls this gap that is unique to humans that animals um, do not experience. And it's precisely the primal cry that is a search for a language to fill in that gap um, that emerges in the separation, the traumatic separation that occurs at birth. Um, the cry is to uh, please, uh, please teach me a way to, uh, for my body to move in linguistic relationship to other humans. Um, and what's unique about human animals um, is that not only do they have this gap that is the result of their, again, particular uh, traumatic birth, um, that's a birth of separation, a birth that creates a gap between body and language that then needs to be mediated, process and performance perhaps, um, a gap between these things that needs to be mediated, 
But what's also unique about human beings is that we haven't handled this gap, this incompletion that is fundamental to our, to our nature, that is unique to the human animal. Well, I dare to say that this is what the qualifier human means when we say human animal. This is what is unique about the human. We haven't dealt with this, this potentiality, this gap, this incompletion very well. Usually we allow uh, tyrannical systems like feudalism or sometimes God or religiosity, um, certainly capitalism, to occupy the space of that gap, to exploit it um, in, in, in ways that we turn back to just becoming animals who are working incessantly for the sake of accumulating more and more capital, for the sake of capital, or working incessantly, I don't know, in a feudal system for the sake of, 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 of the king or the lord, um, uh, of, 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 of blood, of nobility. And um, so hitherto in, in human history, I don't philosophically think that we've dealt with this potentiality of the gap um, uh, of, of human incompleteness very well. We've, we've, we've given it over to, 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 to tyrannical forces and systems. And part of what I've been thinking about with your work and why I love the psychoanalytic dimension of the first five minutes of Varnum um, is precisely because it forces us to think about this gap anew um, in, in, in non-tyrannical ways. It makes us anxious and in psychoanalysis, anxiety is actually a good thing because anxiety means that we are confronting this traumatic gap at the origin of birth that then allows us to think anew about how to deal with the gap, how to mind the gap. Um, and it's precisely this relation between uh, body and language that needs to be thought, uh, uh, thought anew. And I think that, uh, I, I don't mean this uh, because I know this pandemic has been absolutely exhausting and especially for asymmetrically for the poor, um, for labor, uh, we have uh, there are different luxuries of times uh, of time uh, during during this pandemic. It feels differently for different classes, different races, different ethnicities, different nations, uh, different communities. Um, but what it's done is is it's 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 generated an anxiety in me that's forced me to think about anew about this relationship uh, between or this distance, this gap um, that is at the ontological or fundamental essence of of human being and to think anew about that in a creative or a beautiful way. So I wanted to bring in this term of beauty, which I know um, is, is cliche, maybe you're trite, but um, the art of incompletion is, can be quite a beautiful um, thing. And uh, 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 no pun intended, Bhatani, but, um, um, and, and how to think about uh, the possibilities of creativity, of beauty from um, uh, a liminal, a, a, a gapish space between body and language. Um, together in a processual way or working through as humans is something that the pandemic has really compelled me to do. And so it's also um, compelled me to revisit um, uh, uh, now a collegial uh, uh, relationship with you and, and, and also a viewing relationship with, with your work, uh, of course, with your brilliant course now uh, with Chandra's work uh, starting yesterday. So uh, thank you uh, for, for, for doing that. And if, we can, if I can now um, ask you a few questions on precisely this, uh, the possibilities for creation um, within this gap, if I've made some sense, within this, um, this, this, this fundamental space of, of, of the incomplete uh, of the human animal in particular, um, I can then kick it back to you. So I'll, I'll offer just a few, a few questions, less than the, the first pack or cluster of questions. So what I wanted to ask following my brief remarks is, does our uniqueness, um, our human uniqueness, uh, Again, this fundamental incompletion. Um, so does this have something to do, uh, again, do you agree or do you, do you have any other thoughts? Does this have something to do with the fact that for some reason we've always had to suffer torturously our incompletion in human society? Again, uh, sometimes religiosity, uh, uh, capitalism, feudalism, um, ecological catastrophe. Uh, as Wizier brought up, the last conversation for Marg was on uh, the Anthropocene. Um, why have we always suffered this, this our, our fundamental incompletion as humans um, in human societies? Um, why haven't we worked hard, very hard and creatively um, within the gap um, that is the most beautiful thing about the particularity of the human animal? Why have we let that gap be ex uh, exploited by systems we ourselves build, capital, feudalism, God, um, etc.? cetera? Um, yeah, so why have we built these structures um, that allow our fundamental human gap of incompletion to be exploited, um, to oppress us rather than, than, than cultivate us, um, than, 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 than propel us processually. Um, it seems like crisis, ecological catastrophe, pandemic, 
right? Um, economic depressions. It's a perfect time, you would think, for us uniquely human animals, incomplete human animals, to work creatively to build anew. Uh, Trojan Karatani's uh, suggestions on how Fukushima was actually quite a beautiful disaster. It could have been. Um, so to create a new, um, but we always seem to turn back into panicked animals. This is the odd thing in times of crisis, precisely at the point where the anxiety of the gap um, of, of human incompleteness is revealed, we turn back into animals, to inhumans, um, to panicked animals, you know, buying lots of toilet paper and stuff and, and uh, automatically, automatonically. Um, so why do we do that in times of crisis, of, of catastrophe? Um, what's happening here and what can, can, the, can, can, can you, the artist, solve this for us, the philosophers? And uh, so I'll, I'll, I'm going to mute myself and throw this back to you. I want a solution. <laughs> of course, I'm going to give you a solution in three easy steps, Rohit, which you can practice this evening and all the world's problems will be solved. Um, no, but jokes aside, um, in the talking you, of uh, around beauty, I, I remember a beautiful Indonesian book I read called Beauty is a Wound. And it, um, I think as, a, as an idea, it, it provokes something that leads us to, to deal with this question. So it was a big question, I think. Why we've built the structures which keep us in this perpetual state of incompletion, I think is an answer that I can't fully answer to. I mean, it, I think it has to do with uh, centuries and centuries of kind of the way societies and capital have been organized. And in actual fact, you're more the expert on those things. You know, why those structures persist is something that you can talk about better. But I, I was thinking about uh, the idea of the concept of suffering. So, I mean, I think that the most cliched idea around the artist is that the artist is one who suffers, right? Artistic angst is always proposed as the site from which the artist's own creativity arises. Um, and I'm not either disagreeing or agreeing with it. I think it's just simplistic. So that's one idea that I want to start with. So have we always looked perhaps at the artist as being the one who exists or grows out of the cracks of society, almost weed-like? There's something that we think, we expect the artistic commun community to be resilient in a moment when the rest of the world cannot be resilient. And I think that's um, something to be questioned because I think it again leads us to this very problematic um, kind of division. So I think what I want to really talk about to tie together all of your questions and the title of today's talk, Incompletion, is to really let us, let us really think deeply about incompletion and all of these notions of separation, whether it's uh, from the moment of birth, you know, from the moment, from the start of education, where we actually already start to separate thought, knowledge, uh, embodied knowledge, disembodied knowledge. And this starts, unfortunately for us, quite early on in childhood, um, which is one reason I've always, as far as I, I can, I've tried to have my own children educated in the schools which the philosopher Krishnamurti started with the hope that a thinker like him, who's always talked about this distance or separation as a violence and has always urged his readers to actually think about there not being a separation and actually goes on to say it's as easy as that. It's as easy as not allowing that to exist. So I'm thinking, as you said rightly, the structures for some reason, are unquestioned. And until we're taught to actually question and to disagree, to be disagreeable, and not to constantly just follow the rules without a kind of a questioning, I think these patterns are, are just being replicated. And even if we're looking at uh, perhaps how the dance community is, is resolving the problems which the pandemic have thrown up at it. My worry is we're still not really thinking around or, or trying to, to come up with a creative solution. We're just transferring a problematic practice onto another medium. 
you know, from a problematic rehearsal in a studio, which actually has no sense or meaning. We're just doing the same thing through the screen. But it isn't, it isn't that. It's this kind of laziness, which um, I'm hoping we can bridge through conversations like this. What does it actually mean to change something fundamentally at its foundation? What does it mean to really wake up every morning and, and think again about the body, the way we live, the way we eat breakfast, the way we then sit the rest of the day, uh, you know, at a table, you know, and all of and those the mundanity. Can we can we really start to to question and rethink rather than, as you've said many times, rather than just waiting it out? And I think this idea of waiting it out, things going back seems like a terrible waste of this moment which we're in. So I want to say perhaps because we're always even in a conversation like this, we're compartmentalizing each other's knowledges. And we're sort of, the communication between us is going as a kind of a system of commenting on, I'm asked to comment on, say, a psychoanalytical idea, and you're trying to make a commentary on dance. But I'm just, I'm hoping to look in the future towards a moment where the arts and, and critical discourse cannot be a separation as two uh, separate worlds that sometimes meet, sometimes talk to or even at each other. But can we from this moment even think about a togetherness or an arriving, a looping, as I, as I spoke about, something where, as Rizio said earlier on, that we can actually derive a new language. Because as she rightly said, I think that's that's the call of the the call of the day isn't for dancers to have one course in university where they read uh, Freud and Deleuze, but the need is for that for Freud and Deleuze to also be looking back. So I'm I'm hoping that through these multiple webinars and and these kinds of conversations that actually we can we can find a new really a new form, not just transference of a form. Sorry, that came back. That comes back to you. Okay, no, that's great because I think that's that that I, I that's a great solution. Um, uh, or it's it's a great um, it's a great roadmap to uh, what I think is the solution. And I think this is the way that I've also been thinking again in the speculative moment of of, of my work. Let's just call it um, reading and writing and teaching. Right, pedagogy has become really important to me in the past three years in the American Academy, at least where I grew up and the European Academy, um, uh, pedagogy is almost looked at as, as a chore um, that is a distracting chore um, that takes us away from publishing, from giving, uh, you know, sort of lectures uh, from or working on our tenure promotion files. Um, and something that's been really special to me has been focusing for the past five years on the pedagogical dimension of, 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 of thought. Um, and what that's really done, again, has compelled me to to try, not consciously, I don't think, to bridge this, um, not bridge this gap, it, uh, but to, to look at uh, uh, works of dance, to, to, to watch film, um, to, to, to see art um, as, as arguments. And this has also allowed me to reflect on the absolutely dire state. Um, thankfully, we have Marg and a really, really wonderful agenda that's ahead for Marg. Um, the dire state of art criticism, um, where it's almost like people don't, uh, don't, write about art as argument. I can't watch a Kiristami film, for instance, without thinking about it argumentatively, or, as, 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 or, or I can't watch, uh, um, you know, Sri Chandra's um, uh, performance or, or a philosophical enactment, yours, uh, Varnam, I, without thinking argumentatively about it. And that's been, I think, because of my pedagogical turn that, that I've been confronted with, uh, with, with trying to work with the gap between that is fundamental to humans uh that, that that's not about compart but that doesn't result in this compartmentalization of the arts on the one hand Deleuze and and and, and freud on the other um so i've been it's a struggle though and um it's an unconscious struggle um and it's something that i think that we 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 as 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 thinkers you know let's even get away from the we went we moved from you moved from performance artist to artist and we might just say thinker 
um, now um, and become a bit more abstract uh, uh, with regards to what we are or what all of us here today are. Um, and start to really, really work hard to, to resuscitate um, the writing, the movement uh, of, of criticality. Uh, I remember, I always bring this, up, this example up, so if any of my students are here, they're going to be annoyed by my repetition, but remember I'm getting old and reflecting on my, my decrepitude, my bodily decrepitude. But um, the old, like even stale, but I think really animated Clement Greenberg, Harold Rosenberg art critical debates from the 60s and 70s, Arthur Danto, where, um, where you know, uh, the arguments over an interpretation of a work between these critics made or break, br broke careers. They caused massive fights. I, I can't even imagine um, a sort of uh, like a, a critical circle or salon, art critical um, or philosophical circle or salon today that, um, that doesn't have this feeling of charge. I think uh, uh, Rizio nicely brought um, that, that, that term that you brought up with regards to Chandra's, Chandra's um, motto. Right, that a dancer charges the stage, the charge of a high stakes way of looking at listening, um, at thinking uh, in the world. It's, it seems to be lost. And I think this time has really, pedagogy, my turn to pedagogy, and this time of, of, of this lots of time of, 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 of uh, pleasurable boredom um, and pandemic and, 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 and separation in a certain sense um, has at least prompted me to start that that, that, that track that you, you outlined in your last response. Um, and this gets us, I think, completely, and this is where I want to turn it back over to you, this, this to, to, finish, to finish up, um, this gets us completely away uh, from what I think is the wrong, the wrong obsession um, in the arts world and the, uh, the academic world throughout the world, not just here, but everywhere, which is this question of accessibility. You also brought this up with regards to our talk. I hope it was, or conversation, I hope it was more accessible than... Than, than we academics at least tend, uh, we tend not to be terribly inaccessible or inaccessible. Um, but this obsession with accessibility, um, with regards to sort of uh, putting putting art or movement on like vans or, or 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 buses and taking them to the poor to different, you know, this anxiety that we feel as thinkers, as academics and artists about um, making sure everyone can see what we're thinking um, uh, or, or or producing. Um, uh, artistically, um, that uh, it's almost a narcissism that we have with this obsession uh, with accessibility as a society, as, an, as, a, as, a, as a humanities uh, thinking society, academically and artistically. Um, it's a narcissism because we assume that, um, that, that it's, we say that it's unfair for, for let's say, the poor, for, for um, the remotely situated in villages or whatnot. It's unfair that they're not able to see what we think and what we what we make in cities. Um, and I think that trying to not compartmentalize, um, to think deeply about pedagogical practice um, uh, is, a, is a very, very helpful way of de-narcissizing our approach to accessibility. And so I'll stop with that sort of uh, loaded thought. We had to conclude with some charge um, and, and chuck it over to you. I think we have a couple of minutes before the Q&A session, or I, I think Rizio will We'll, we'll recapitulate and, and open it up. So um, thank you again so much for this conversation, uh, Patmani, and please conclude. Uh. Uh, thank you, uh, Rohit and Patmani. This is, oh. uh, you know, my video is still off, but uh, while listening to you, uh, I have, uh, I've been thinking about two things which I want to uh, bring, bring in here at this moment. Maybe during the Q&A, you can address those also. I was thinking about um, uh, you know this this triad of uh, the tangible body, uh, the intangible world, and the the mind, which is uh, we it's 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 so uh, we can't even define you know that kind of a triad, and that is what we are now still talking about, but uh, it's still within the the two. Uh, two spaces that we talked about, tangible body and intangible world, are still within the sensory, within our sensory apprehension. And, uh, but, but I'm thinking about the space where, like, because we are in this pandemic situation and a, a virus is chasing us, uh, etc. Um, uh, I was also thinking about a place where uh, your mind is confronted with uh, 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 
something which is not really uh, you cannot apprehend in, in a sensory manner at all so what would the mind's response be the human mind's response be and I, this also brings me uh, back to those two questions which you started this conversation with uh, one is um, about uh, that question of the during the pandemic and how art is useful or not useful etc uh, or essential or not essential, uh, where uh, Rohit asked this question, can, maybe a dancer can be a philosopher, can, but can a philosopher like me start to dance? You know, that is one question. And Padmini asked this question about uh, in the uh, during the lockdown, people would turn to Zoom or other, other spaces like this, digital spaces to uh, look at art as some kind of a lazy option of a uh, uh, lazy way of passing time can art be looked at like that so these two uh, questions which are connected uh, i was thinking about how do you when you confront this uh, i i was reminded of a, a book by havelock ellis uh, the dance of life in which he records livingston uh, in africa so livingston uh, uh, ellis records um, uh, livingston and says uh, that uh, when uh, the Bantu tribe, the ancient Bantu people, one division of the Bantu people confronts or uh, encounters another division, they ask each other, what's your dance today? Uh, they don't say, how are you or, uh, you know, etc. But this is the form, this is the way in which they address each other, greet each other, what's your dance? And then Livingston goes on to say that the, the, uh, the savage, does not uh, preach uh, his religion, but he dances it. So I, I was also thinking about what Patmini said towards the uh, end, and Rohit uh, was happy about that kind of a solution where, you know, you have that fluidity uh, where anxiety can be, um, you know, slowly erased, uh, where you do, you're not within the limits of, categories and disciplines so you move out of it push your boundaries and like actually come out to to move in close over and then anxiety slowly leaves you and maybe that is the moment where you might start to uh, start to build a new language create a new language so this thought i'm just leaving with you because it is also connected to uh, what uh, uh, we are doing uh, after this, the next conversation in the series is between philosopher and another philosopher, Sundar Sarukai, and um, uh, uh, physicist uh, Roger Molina, who is the editor of uh, Leonardo magazine, I mean, journal at the MIT. Uh, they are actually talking about uh, this first question that I raised uh, between uh, if we confront uh, uh, the the nano world, the microbial world. The, uh, Roger is uh, the, engaged with a project called Nano Provocations. What can it provoke? How can art be provoked by this nano and microbial worlds? Uh, so that is what we are talking about in the next uh, uh, next conversation in the series on uh, art science. It's on art science. So uh, I'm just leaving this uh, thought open like this. Uh, I think there is a possible way that you're showing through this conversation. Uh, and I would hand it over to Renalini to begin the Q&A. Uh, thank you very much again, Rohit and uh, Patmini, for the very insightful uh, conversation. I hope to continue this because you are also, as you mentioned, art criticism. You are both going to be on the pages of Marg very soon uh, in the art criticism space. So I hope we continue this conversation. Over to you, Renalini. Uh, yeah, thank you so much for that really insightful session, uh, Rohit and Padmini. Uh, we've already got a bunch of questions lined up. Um, so uh, let me start with a question that um, uh, Likla has uh, asked. And um, uh, this is actually tied to something that I've been also thinking about. It was uh, mentioned by Padmini uh, right at the beginning. Uh, but uh, so Likla is asking, um, in the exploration between the relationship between movement and language, 
where does music fit in so um uh, and something that uh, came up um, uh, which uh, in fact as i said padmini mentioned right at the beginning she was talking about how uh, the latest project is something that she is doing with uh, philosophers and then there is uh, this line that she used where she said um, dance needs to be explained so uh, the one thing that suddenly struck me is that actually in terms of all the performances that i've seen um, contemporary or traditional i've not come across a single dance performance which in some way or the other is not intercepted with music or language as in it's just been from beginning to end purely about body and movement without any kind of additional language coming in there or explanation coming in there uh, but uh, padmini how would uh, could we reconceptualize dance without actually any intervention of language and a music well there have been completely silent performances yeah so mm. there there have been examples of that where uh, there was a kind of a, a revolt again the fact that the dancer was was always being somehow a slave to the music whether one mm. is looking back at say the balletic tradition or even the indian classical dancers where then you're not only a slave to the 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 musicality of song the narrative of the song but also to the rhythmic uh, what's controlled by the natvanars so dance comes out of that history then when one moves into a kind of a more recent contemporary uh, moment dancers have started to work more with ideas of rupture dissonance so not so much following the music but can music and dance somehow exist as two independent layers and can there be conversation between those without one being dependent on the other you know and then further there've been dancers who've pushed like in my work wall dancing which is 3 hours long and there's barely 20 minutes of sound so it's almost completely silent which i love to watch because i i can watch movement endlessly but i'm aware that that's asking a lot from an audience because i do think that people sound and music are are so familiar to us you know we're always if we're exercising or cooking we put music on you know music is something that somehow more easily transcends kind of all of our blocks and watching the body watching movement especially if it's abstract is always a struggle somehow so and but choreographers have decided to actually engage the struggle and and go further into the areas which are difficult some have just said no i need it to just be easy so again to come back to this whole accessible non accessible kind of conversation but to just end by quickly answering the idea of of uh, sound text i mean i i work much more with sound not so much with music but for me i really use text as sound in moments so i'm not always anxious about meaning so much because i i'm always very interested in giving multiple choices to people in the audience you know you can choose if you want to follow the text you can also choose if text sort of dissolves into sound and becomes a part of a sonic landscape and you can choose also just ignore the whole thing and just watch the dance and i think it's in this kind of uh transitioning where there's a, a kind of a possibility of an open engagement where dance or, or um dance moves away from kind of a forced entertainment which is also actually the title of a very famous theater group in the uk forced entertainment so yeah how do we move how do we get away from this idea of forced entertainment in a sense okay um coming to you rohit uh, uh abhay uh, has posed an interesting question uh, where he's talking about um, how um, you know at this time there's a tendency as we are looking inwards um, and you know we are focusing more on practice with ourselves etc it also tends to become as you were talking about um, you know the luxury of time that itself um, often becomes something that's indulgent and um, 
it doesn't uh, necessarily make our work more accessible so he is concerned about the accessibility issue in the sense that since we are living in uh, a social space uh, you know and in some sense we are of course in a very privileged position within that social space what um, isn't there a kind of responsibility in terms of making our work um, uh, or in uh, in terms of making artistic work less self indulgent and actually reaching out to more people um, uh, rohit would you like to take that question sure thanks abai is is yeah. is, is, is challenging or if you want to padmini can also respond to that like there's been yeah Huh. Great. I can start with a few thoughts. Thanks for the question, Abai. It is a really interesting question, and um, I do understand that anxiety about uh, about um, uh, some 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 people having uh, you know a, a very particular class privilege, especially with regards to time and luxury in this you know uh, sort of almost epic time of pandemic of of universal pandemic, um, and I, I take that and I I, I try and. Um, I, 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 I'm certainly very sensitive to the asymmetries um, of fatigue, in particular. My work is turned to um, thinking about fatigue as well, quite a bit. Um, I'm very, very, very sensitive to the asymmetries of experiencing exhaustion and fatigue in these times. Again, between classes, um, between nations, between races, castes, ethnicities, um, and I think it's a very important um, point that you've brought up. I'm just not so sure whether or not my work. But or my what I'm thinking, it may be, but or um, is I, I don't I don't have an anxiety about making it um, accessible in the sense of distributing it to to these people. I, in fact, I want to save them from myself. It would just exhaust them even more. Um, those who are feeling much more exhaustion than than the bourgeoisie, than than than, than people like myself um, by accident of of birth, and uh, you know. Um, so I, I'm very sensitive to your question. Um, I think that for me. The accessibility question is also uh, something I've been trying to think through again to go back to what I was saying about pedagogy. Um, pedagogy is uh, is uh, something that has been lost. It's actually again been uh, thought of as, as as more of a chore that interrupts the writing of our books as academics. The um, you know sort of uh, tenure files and promotions that we we need to be seeking constantly. The applications for grants. I know many of you have to do this all the time. Um, and so pedagogy has been there have been thoughts actually in Europe and America, and I, this this might happen as a result of the fact that higher education is is crumbling. Um, it, the, uh, secondary and primary education, except for special places like Krishnamurti schools and this and that, but as a, as a structure, have already have already crumbled um, for the most part. Um, and as we know, public education, um, as we as we want to think about it, uh, but higher education is crumbling. And there have been suggestions that we separate, we make, we create two different types of academic. A pedagogical academic who teaches in an institute that's a teaching college, and then just have a series of research institutes. So separating research from teaching, which I think is absolutely catastrophic and is moving in the absolute wrong direction with regards to accessibility. I'll just say that like Freud, because I, I work with, uh, with, with, with a lot of Freud's texts, uh, the, the, psychoanal the, thought, the sort of father founder of psychoanalysis of continental, it's called continental psychoanalysis. He used to he used to respond to this question. He used to get criticized a lot, and he still does. Um, for his his in his clinical practice, most of his 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 patients um, were uh, were. I'll end with this, and then we can move to more questions. But it's a great one. Uh, he most of his patients were rich, very bourgeois, um, typically women, right at that time, Victorian sort of women, or in in Vienna, um, and he's constantly attacked for. Uh, because psychoanalysis is really expensive, it takes a lot of time. You need the luxury of time. You need to go five days a week for three hours a day, and it's not just sitting. It's not just the, the exhaustion of the session of the analytic session. It's also the exhaustion of of having to work with that session outside of the session constantly in your head. So it's a very exhausting and um, yes, uh, luxury of time oriented profession. Psychoanalysis, and uh, there were there were people who were proposing setting up psychoanalytic. Uh, Psychoanalytic, uh, you know, clinics for the poor, and he just found this to be absolutely absurd. And uh, his very simple response, and I'll stop here, was, "It's the rich who are sick, right? It's the bourgeoisie who are sick. Um, that is why psychoanalysis is a bourgeois, um, a bourgeois science." Uh, and so that, 
I, I just want to, I'm speculating on this question of accessibility and I want to ensure that I, I take very seriously your concern. Um, but my speculative thoughts are trying to compel us to, to think about this accessibility question with regards to thought, uh, art, um, uh, differently, a bit differently, uh, while, while maintaining our concern for, for access in the more typical sense of the word of um, ensuring that, that, that museums are distributed throughout countries and are free and accessible. So I'll stop that. Thank could you. Bye-bye. Could I add a couple of things? Please. So I'm thinking also, can we bring the conversation um, around numbers or this number game, footfall, all of these kind of corporate terminologies that we're now using? You know, if I, if I uh, go to a corporate sponsor to, to, do, um, to fund my performance, you know, the first question is, what's the footfall? How many numbers are you going to reach? But I'm, I'm saying, can we bring the conversation back to being around quality, A, not about numbers, quality? Can we, can we think about quality and not quantity? And A, I'm really worried about the fact that the onus always seems to be on the maker, on the artist, to sort of get their work out. I'm wondering, isn't there also a responsibility from society and the intermediary bodies, uh, the promoters, the presenters, the, the curators, to actually do this? The artist has to make the art, right? That's, that's what they need to concentrate on. If the artist is always in this anxiety of how do I expand, how do I reach more and more people, I feel we're all, it's a very one-sided kind of approach to thinking about this. So what I'm saying is not only about, yeah, whether you want to make, for me, this word accessibility gets oddly mixed up with something that making about ease, the ease of, of reception somewhere. But I feel like the conversation is much larger, you know, which also reminds me of, of Rizzio's, this little survey where everyone says, is talking about the inessential nature and as we see in India, a lot of countries, you know, there are sort of grants are given out to MSMEs and all these terminologies, which I don't really know. But where are the grants? How are artists going to survive this? So I'm just thinking in the making of the or proposing as the artist as inessential, there's a, a deep problem. There's a deep divide between art and society that's resulted in this thinking and that's what that's what needs to be repaired. How can art actually be essential to society? And what is the work that society needs to do as well to kind of close that space? Okay. Um, uh, Padmini, there's a, um, another question that's come up. It's actually a very basic question, but I realize it, it is in some ways also so insightful. So Rujuta has asked, how does one begin uh, or learn dancing at a time when one can't go and meet a teacher? Um, and uh, my big question here is that, uh, of course, uh, you know, we are thinking, if, uh, let's assume that, of course, usually we think that find somebody who might want to learn da dance already has some kind of accessibility and knowledge of the form and therefore has some aspirations, etc. But um, you've talked about the uh, dance and performance having dealt with all kinds of crises in the past. But in some ways, has, has there ever been that crisis of not having to turn to anything to actually learn how a performance tradition works? In terms of, can you just start off on a completely blank slate, you know, uh, and, you know, work with new movements yourself? I don't know. It's like a big radical question and idea there, but then, yeah. So I often say about myself, because huh. um, after I, I stopped working with Chandra, when I started to develop my own work, so this was already in the early 90s, there was no internet. And I was, we were living, I was living in a city, which I still do, Chennai, where there were no kind of other resources available to me in terms of practices or knowledges that I needed for me to go further in my, uh, what I was asking of the body. And so what we would do in those days is we would read about dance. 
we couldn't watch endless YouTube videos, but it was just through kind of reading and a researching of one's own body that the entire length of my practice, I mean, um, kind of emerged. So I'm really proposing for us, and I, I said to many uh, people later on, I think it was so lucky that I didn't grow up um, in Europe or America or a place where there was already so much contemporary dance to A, confuse me and distract me, that I was in this isolation. And just being in that kind of isolation really led me to do the hard work by myself. And I think that if we could all go back to thinking, somebody doesn't have to give us dance. We can give dance to ourselves. And we okay. have so many things for us. We have texts on dance. We have a uh, kind of text written about choreographer. We have access to all kinds of music, compositional ideas, which are key for dancers to learn structures. So there are so many other things that can actually lead us to very interesting places within dance itself. Why learn? It's always, we always then fall back into this mode of imitation. Teach yourself, learn for yourself. That's what I, I would say. Can I add something very quickly as uh, to, to be the compartmentalized academic uh, in the proverbial room, I guess is what they're called on, on Zoom or, or Zoho, what the technology. Um, just to give, I think it's Rujita who asked the, the, the good question. Yes, yes, um, yes. Okay, so the, the, just a reference uh, that sort of picks up on what I was just saying. Um, it's actually not a philosopher I, I, whose, whose ideas ger like germinate um, with my work so much, but this is a brilliant book. Um, it's by Jacques Ranciere, uh, who's quite fashionable in the art world, um, in the contemporary art world. He's written a, a book that's not read very much. It's called The Ignorant Schoolmaster, and it's about an 18th century um, French teacher who um, is teaching in Belgium, in Belgium without knowing their language of Flemish. And it's a really beautiful read. Um, it's a short read, and it's really clear uh, to get back to accessible. And I think it it, it resonates with some of what Patani was also just saying in response to your your question, Rujita. So thank you. Okay, great. Yes, actually, because uh, there's uh, some uh, people have also been asking about whether you know there's certain specific thoughts or um, you know preoccupations or readings that one can focus on during this period and actually build on their practice so things like this actually would be um, of great help and as i said i'm we're also thinking of spaces where you don't otherwise have access to many of the things and in some ways that's a great way of rethinking how we are learning and how we are building on things um rohit there's a, another question in fact which has been posed by uh, prema vishwanathan it's um a slightly complicated question uh, but um okay so she said i'm going to be reading this out actually um she said the reference to the anxiety engendered by the painful rupture at birth and to art as a way to navigate this incompletion by inverting the tyranny of treating the audience as a consumer rather than a participant, brought to mind Michel Foucault's critique of the dehumanizing medical gaze, and more recently, Atul Gawande's insights into the alienation inherent in current medical practice. Is there a connection we can draw between the two in the time of corona? Um, I'm, I'm trying to also figure out the question, but I get a sense that she's talking about that that very uh, gap that you talked about, that space from which there emerges that sense of in incompletion as well as trauma, in fact. Uh, we are dealing with, you know, the human and animal in a totally different context, of course, at present times. But is there some strange way in which you can draw connections between the two? Uh, and yes. Okay, I think Prema should have been in my place uh, because uh, that, 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 uh, so you, you've you've gotten me here, and I I actually don't know, I, I do I do know I do know Foucault's work. Um, my training is largely in in, in Western philosophy. Um, um, I don't know um, I don't know Atul Gawande. I think was the citation. Um, his yes, work yes. On, on on medicalization and, and and gaze. So I'm not going to be able to speak about that, but I've noted it down, and I'm, I'm going to run to the internet. Um, to okay. illegally download the PDF after after we finish the uh, 
the conversation only because Amazon is not delivering. So I have to turn to pirated versions of books. But um, it, it, if I can take your question um, as an opportunity to try and clarify some of what I was saying about anxiety in relationship to um, uh, the unique, um, uniquely human, or the unique, the, the, the gap that makes us uniquely human animals, right? From the very, very moment of birth, right? Um, if I can say something about that in, in, in a clarifying way, um, You'll, you'll, you'll let me off the hook, I think, Prema, with your, with your much more erudite question than I, than I have a capacity to answer. Um, so so what, what I want to say is that that anxiety for um, uh, philosophers who are thinking uh, critically, and, and, or sorry, thinking rigorously about, uh, about psychoanalysis, um, especially Freud, just reading Freud um, instead of a lot of secondary literature, um, anxiety, that moment of anxiety at birth, the primal scream, the gap, right? Um, um, the, the need to mediate the, the gap between that humans, the particularly human um, task, um, uh, labor of having to mediate the gap between body and mind, uh, uh, between body and language. Uh, 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 that anxiety um, that emerges is precisely what that gap is. And, and the fact that we have to do all of this work, animals just get, to, gophers just get to dig when they're born. Um, there's no gap between themselves and, and, and the earth. Um, dogs, my dog just gets to bark and be pet and, and, and eat and, and drink and sleep. Um, so we're burdened quite beautifully with this, I like this, be this beauty uh, as a wound at the very moment of birth that is anxiety. The problem is, is that we, we've, Historically, and these are the structures I was, I was, the Padme and I were talking about. Um, these structures that we build are like Xanexes, or I guess they call that call it Restel here, maybe or something. They, that um, we, we, we instead of working beautifully and creatively with this anxiety to, as Rizzio put it, um, overcome it together um, in constant vigilance of being together, we develop structures um, that close the gap, um, that turn us into animals, hard workers. Um, going to work to the office, doing a good job, serving capital, putting more in the pot that is called capital, um, or the Lord. I mean, I'm not picking on capitalism, I'm picking on all of human history. Um, so the relationship between anxiety and um, the possibility of beauty and creation is absolutely essential to the way that I'm thinking, speculatively. Um, and so you've compelled me to, to be more accessible and, and to clarify that. Um, so thank you for that. Um, and I was trying to suggest very speculatively that this pandemic, um, and it might, it might be a personal thing, um, has compelled me to revisit intellectually and aesthetically that, that, that gap. Um, and I, I don't mean to say that there's anything salutary about um, a pandemic, or, 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 or I don't mean to dismiss, to go back to Abai's point, which I think was really, really important, the asymmetries um, uh, and the, uh, you know, the, the luxury of time that we have, or some of us have, and, and that others don't. Um, but all I can do is think about my own condition as a bourgeois, um, intellectual by accident of birth. And uh, so that, that's, that, that's an inadequate answer to your, your very good question, but that's what I have to say. Uh. Okay, great. So um, we'll take one last question before we close the session. Um, and I think this came up also uh, in, um, in the last session because um, besides the pandemic, there's also been, of course, the Black Lives Matter movement, which has been gaining attention everywhere. So uh, Nikita Sarkar uh, has asked about, you know, this matter of beauty and aesthetics, uh, especially in the context of the racial empowerment movement uh, today. And in what way, say, dance and movement can actually contribute to um, rethinking beauty and aesthetics uh, and race? Uh, Padmini, would you like to take this question? I mean, I can say a few things about this. Um, but I think it's a very large, uh, a very relevant question. But um, it's also for me, like a lot of the things around that discourse seem like they're happening so far away. But we've been seeing recently images uh, of protesters actually turning to dance, right? Looking to re like uh, to relook, to reclaim like African tribal dance sources, you know, really going back to indigenous uh, movement um, ideas. And of course, as societies, we've so kind of 
quickly and easily gone into a kind of an urbanization or a, in India especially where the, the aesthetic of the classical dancers sort of has erased what we know was a much larger history of movement and that was some of also the early research that, that Chandra did in her practice was really going to villages, watching folk movement, watching uh, tribal movement, just to have a larger understanding of what physicality means. So yes, I think we can use symbolically in a sense, um, movement or kind of um, iconic moments of movement phrases to, to make a statement about uh, the body kind of returning to the past, in a sense. But I think I would also urge us to be caution or careful about kind of possibilities of just descending into an easy tokenism or an appropriation. So often when I go like in the city to say, see like a Sufi singer, it's, I always find it deeply troubling. It seems to me like we're just transplanting things, taking something out of a context in order to make ourselves feel better or more inclusive. So I think that we need to also, yes, in a moment like now, I can understand why people need to do African folk dance on the streets. But in a later moment, can we actually reflect on, on what, what it is that we're doing and then what it actually means in terms of, yeah, who's being appropriated by whom? Great. I think. Um, uh, oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. Okay, okay. We're concluding. Yes. I was... Yes. Rohit, do you want to contribute <laughs> and you want to answer that question also? Again, very pithily because uh, um, okay. I think the, sure. the response has happened, but just very and quickly because I know we're running out of time. Um, yeah. But the philosopher Slavoj Žižek, um, I have to get some philosophy chops in as well. You know, I feel like everyone's rightfully interested in, in the dancer in the room. Um, <laughs> but so. Uh, the philosopher Slavoj Žižek has just written a very interesting piece that is playing with this this forced choice. Uh, this, it's like this. Uh, if you, I don't know if you if any of you know Pascal, the famous philosopher Pascal. Um, he had a wager, right? And so um, Jacques Le Goff, uh, the historian philosopher, uh, called this turned this wager into um, your money or your life. Um, and hitherto, before this pandemic, let's say, uh, typically. Um, if you're faced with that choice, you, you really have to choose your life because what is money without uh, being alive? Although recently um, there was a fire in my neighborhood and I was very impressed with how heroically people were going in to get their belongings, their money at the, at the potential expense of their lives. Uh, lives. Really, I think thinking, what is life without, like I'd rather die than not have money. But anyhow, the typical choice is the logical choice is to choose your life, even if you're going to be poor over um, money when faced with that choice. And what has happened with the, what, what he puts it very beautifully, what's so unfair about um, us bourgeois and, and, and white people in America, I mean, I shouldn't, I'm, I'm, an, I'm an American. Um, what we're making black people do um, with these amazing, amazingly courageous protests is we're making them choose their money over their lives. The amount of risk that we're putting these people who have to protest against our racism um, because enough is enough. Um, in a time of pandemic where they have to be absolutely close together, there were 15,000 people in Alexanderplatz in Berlin. I mean, uh, this is extraordinarily risky. Um, the fact that what we, we as a society, and this goes back to Abai's concern, we as a society, of, of, of a racialized society, global society, um, and deeply bourgeois uh, society, need to reflect on our responsibility for putting these people at danger, for having to protest against our illness. Um, and so that's, it's, 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 a, it's a different way um, to, to, to choose money over their lives, right? To, to, um, uh, to put their lives at risk in order to just not be poor and screwed anymore. So um, that, that, I just wanted to put something in there about the Black Lives Matter movement, which I think is absolutely phenomenal. And that's it. So, yeah. Sorry, we've gone over time. So. No, no, that's uh, thank you all for a really uh, stimulating session. Um, Rizio, would you have any closing remarks or? Uh... Yeah, and I'll uh, yeah. Uh, thank you, uh, Rohit and Patnavi again. Uh, uh, actually, where Rohit is stopping now uh, is a place uh, where, where we, uh, th this is something which we've been thinking about uh, last webinar also, we thought about this, like this question of money and the paradigm of money and uh, how the Anthropocene today is 
conditioned and uh, made manifest by this economic paradigm. And if we have to move towards a post-human, post-Anthropocene uh, vision of the world, then uh, we have to necessarily shift this paradigm. It is not uh, possible, perhaps, to overnight uh, bring that change. Uh, it, that's not possible. But uh, these conversations that we are doing, uh, as I say, I always say, Marg is a place to show a path. So it is just a certain kind of directional thinking now. Um, where we are, uh, these conversations are really, really opening those possibilities. Because uh, when when we concluded the last conversation, Ravi said we should have a new language, um, and uh, that uh, the question was how how do we move towards that language? And in this uh, conversation, I think we have really come a little uh, ahead in that in that thinking. Uh, where you are saying, Patni, you were saying that like da you can teach yourself dance. You know, I'm actually uh, the, thinking about the bantus that I, that I talked about some time back, where you say, what's your dance? That the bantu who does not preach his religion, but he dances it. And to, uh, from the Bantu till Isadora Duncan, who, who, who said, you know, the dan her dance comes from the solar plexus. Uh, it's, not, it's not like a structured thing which uh, somebody teaches, teaches you, but it comes, dance springs from your solar plexus. So the possibility of uh, moving towards uh, a fluidity, which is, uh, you know, uh, which is different from the categories that the economic paradigm gives you, that I think is the place where this dance of ideas uh, today uh, has brought us. I'm very thankful to both uh, uh, Rohit and Patmini for this and uh, Marinalini for conducting this. Um, uh, I think, uh, as I said, the next webinar, we will announce the date and um, time, but it is on uh, Nano provocations uh, and art science uh, between uh, is the conversation uh, between Mar uh, Sundar Sarukai and Roger Molina uh, that we will inform all of you about it. And in the coming days, as I also said in the last conversation, we are uh, reconceptualizing our magazine, we are renewing ourselves as, as a Marg. So I would invite all of you to participate in this, you know, be a part of our journey, subscribe to Marg. It's not just a kind of a promotional thing that I'm saying, but it is going to be an interesting Marg. So I would like uh, all of you to be part of that and be with us as we go forward. Thank you again uh, for this uh, you know, wonderful evening. Thank you. Mirali, you would like to... Yes, um, and just following up on what Rizio said, and also some of the questions that have come, uh, our um, mark salons are going to be made available as um, audio sessions on uh, the Mark Foundation YouTube channel. The Ravi Agarwal Heather Davis session is already there, and we'll be uploading um, today's session as well. Uh, and for further updates on all our events as well as publications, please um, uh, subscribe to the Facebook page as well as the Insta as well as the Instagram page. And uh, yes, look forward to more interactions as well as questions and salon sessions. Um, good night, and uh, hope all of you um, uh, can be there for the next salon. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Nice. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah.